Hello everyone, this is Nisa at Something Beautiful Handcrafts and today I am working on Addie's tartan dress. Take that mouse off of here. Okay, so let's see, where am I? Now, I, I, you know, I looked around for some green and black and red tartan that looked like Addie's in the picture. And I guess it really is just not the season for it. I couldn't find it. Joann's, they were all out of it. I looked a few other places and I'm not really up to ordering it online because it's just one dress. And I really don't want to pay for the extra yardage and the shipping for just one dress. So I decided I would use that pattern and use just a plaid. I'm going to make that dress and a couple other things too, but in this case, I'm going to do a plaid. Okay, so if you're not familiar with that pattern, if you haven't seen her tartan dress, I'm going to put it up on the screen so you can have a look at what it looks like originally. And you can find the pattern. It's part of the Pleasant Company pattern set. Now, you can order the Pleasant Company patterns. I think I mentioned this before. Also, AG Playthings still has the pattern up on the website. You can download the patterns for free. I'm not going to get into whether or not that's legal. I don't know. She has some disclaimers on there about it. And it's been there for years. I got the patterns in 2009 before I even had any dolls. So I, I don't know how long they'll be up there. But if I was you, I would go in and download these patterns. Okay, so now here's what I did. Cut the pieces out. At the top of the dress is a different color yoke. It's white. So here is the white. So I'm going to make the yoke a different color. And then the tartan plaid dress yoke neckband. And this is just, um, just plain white muslin. I have lots of that. It's like a dollar yard. So I have lots of that. And then the tartan plaid dress collar. And I use the, um, I have a rotary blade that I use for cutting those. And this is just the fat quarter from Walmart. Used to be 99 cents and I like $1.50. And with the first fat quarter, I was able to cut out almost the entire dress. Okay. Only thing I had left to do was the back panel. And I was really careful about the way the placement of these were laid down because I want to make sure that uh, when I put these guys together that the plaids will kind of look how closely that plaid lines up. So just want to make sure that they're, they're going to line up well. I'm, I'm just kind of obsessed about that. But let me say this. If you look at the Victorian era dresses and I have a... Um, I have a board on my Pinterest under something beautiful handcrafts where I have lots of pictures of these Victorian to Edwardian era dresses. You'll find that the plaid doesn't necessarily always match up in places. So me being matchy matches me, me being matchy matches, not necessarily period, um, authentic. So that's just me. So here's our big piece of plaid. And this is what I was left with. So if you were curious about how much fabric, you need, of course, the pattern is going to tell you that. But if you know, if you just happen to be at the store buying some fabric, you'd have the pattern on you. Uh, this is what's left of a fat quarter. And I'm only going to use probably half of this. So for the most part, half a yard has been enough for me to make these dresses. Now, like I said, I got almost everything except for the skirt back. So I'm going to cut the skirt back. So like I said, I have a rotary cutter and of course it's across the room from me. I have a really nice one. I forgot what the brand is that everybody always talks about in the quilling circles because I got it to quilt. And then the other one I have, I want to say is a Fiskars. I, as a school teacher, free, former school teacher, you can imagine I'm pretty big on the Fiskars brand of just about everything. Okay, so I got this Fiskars cutting and measure ruler right here. It's got a rotary blade on it in the bit. 
at Walmart. You get it at Joann's, but it was actually cheaper to get it at Walmart. And I got to tell you, I don't know how I never noticed this was there before. Uh, this is so much easier than holding a ruler down and cutting with a rotary blade. And since I'm making skirts, I make skirts for myself, I make a lot of long straight cuts, which can get a little complicated when you do it with a rotary blade. Then also, um, when I'm cutting quilt squares, it's just really nice to have that measurement. I do have quilt block templates. You gotta hold them down and go around them. This is so much easier. And this slices through, I think it's at like six or so layers of fabric. It's really nice, especially if you're making quilt squares. So I was really considering making some, cutting up some quilt squares and putting um, little quilt blocks in my Etsy shop. I don't know, I'm always thinking of something. And this is basically, I wanna say it's just a square, but uh, it's not just a square. It has a flare to it. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Let me turn it this way to you. Okay, so because this is a Victorian dress, and of course they bell out. So these aren't straight squares. They have kind of a trapezoidal angle to them. All right, now what I want to do first is look at the front. Here's my front piece. Actually, it should be turned this way. Because like I said, I'm like obsessive matchy-matchy. I'm going to want that to be as close to the match as possible. I'm folding it in half. That looks right. So I'm going to make sure this is nice and clean and fold it. My ends are where they need to be. That looks great. Really should iron these things before you cut. I've been getting away with that, but it's not a good, the best idea. Just, yeah, just iron them. Don't be me. Well, be me, but not with the non-ironing part. Okay, so I'm gonna check out my squares here. I like that. That seems perfect to me. The height is right. So let's see where this winds up at. Yep, that's lovely, 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 lovely. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut this across. And it just Bam, look at that, how easy that was. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut this other edge. You know, before I do that, I wanna make sure that this is down so it doesn't move. But I gotta tell you, it's, I mean, it's not like super bad if it doesn't move. It kinda helps if these are doll clothes. I think if these were people clothes, I'd be a little more worried. Then again, it is me we're talking about, so uh, I'd probably be obsessed either way. Okay, so here we go, like super nice clean cuts. Now, this curved edge down here, I would want to do with my rotary blade. So I'm just gonna go ahead and trim that up right across here and make that nice and clean. And basically, it's just that easy. I have a vintage Sears Kim Moore. Um, it's just known as a lavender lady. And this machine is older than I am, I believe. I'm 50 years old, maybe. And so it's my primary sewing machine. It's really the only sewing machine that I use. It's not the only one I have, but it's the only one that I use. And you don't necessarily need a sewing machine. 
um, for the first couple um, outfits that I made, actually quite a few of them, I did them by hand. And that's just because in the space I'm in now, it's really not convenient to set up the machine. Uh, it kind of has to be, well, you know, it never really was. Even in the other house, it was, wasn't really convenient. So I finally kind of worked out something here where I have to put some things away in order to uh, make the machine fit and still I can't really walk around the room with it open but like I said you can do these dresses by hand I hand sew a lot um, I finished the Civil War era dress for Eddie which I will post in another video when I'm done with this dress and I did that one completely by hand my hand sewing for the hems isn't all that great and that's only because I just don't want to take time to make the tiny tiny stitches for the bottom hem so to finish off that one I will put it on the machine but I've done the other ones and I've hemmed them by hand so it's, it's not a big deal you just you know develop some hand skill so if you're saying why well, don't have a machine and that stops me from doll sewing don't let that stop you a lot of the ladies in the historical costuming for modern dolls group do their doll work by hand because the seams are just so small that they're hard to do by machine, which is one of the reasons why I decided to use American Girl dolls and not some of the ball jointed dolls or some of the smaller dolls because I thought it would be easier to sew some of the seams with a slightly bigger doll. But also these guys are not as big as my mother's Duckworth dolls or it's a duck house. Oh, I think it's Duck House. Anyway, not as big as some of the porcelain dolls she has. So um, I can collect more of them because they are smaller. Okay, so now at any rate, I'm going to go ahead and put the yoke together. And I'm, you know, now that I think about it, I wish I had recorded the screen so that you could see what I'm seeing as far as the directions are. Though I'm not really sure if that would be a copyright violation. The other dresses that I've been making I have not really gotten into what they look like um, well got them really into really you know detail as to what they look like when I'm making them because these are uh, active sellers active pattern makers and I don't want to run into any copyright infringement by showing you too much of the pattern though I saw somebody on Instagram who did like a so long so maybe i will ask one of the designers if um would mind if i maybe did a sew along so i could kind of tell you a little more more about putting the dress together without actually showing you any of the patterns i don't know i don't know if you're interested in that kind of stuff i could do that okay so looking at the the dress pattern and it says that the materials for the dress, the fabrics can be 44 inches or 60 inches wide. And you saw me do this with a fat quarter, so you know how that works out. Uh, a lot of the small print patterns that I get from the quilt store are, I don't even think those things are 44 inches wide. Um, they're not really big fabric. Now, when I get Joann's, they're easily 44 inches. And sometimes some of them are 60. So the layout is a little different depending on which one. And it says that you need, and of course I can't read that from here, one eighth yard of cotton or cotton blend, one half yard of plaid taffeta, if you were doing the plaid, the buttons, one and one eighth satin ribbon. I have satin ribbon, inch and a half wide. I'm not sure if it's that wide, but I'll improvise. Velcro, and I'm not gonna use any Velcro. I'm gonna use snaps. A uh, half yard of beaded galloon, which I don't even know what that is. Beaded galloon lace, three eighths wide. I'll figure that out later. Uh, one fourth yard of fringe, two inches long, not a problem. Elastic, which I'm not going to use. And one yard of satin ribbon, one eighth wide. Got that. So I have most of the things and I'll improvise the other one. Gives you the layout for the yoke front. And I did that, like I said, with the muslin. Then it gives you a layout for the sleeves, the bodice, the skirt, front and back. And the layout on is so wasteful. <laughs> you know, like I have to pay for this fabric. So I'm not very wasteful. 
but uh, you know, you can do your layout however you want. All right, now, first it tells you to transfer all your markings for placement of elastic buttons, bows, and trims, which sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, depending on what it is that I am uh, planning to make or how I'm planning to make it. So normally what happens is, okay, so on the pattern, you have these dots. And what I normally do is take um, a sharp object, an awl or a needle or what have you, and I punch a hole into these dots. Then I take the marking pen, the erasable marking pen. And I have one that is uh, wet erase and one that is heat erase. And I just dab it into the holes. So that puts the markings onto the fabric. Those are the only ones I worry about, sometimes depending on what I'm stitching, because I don't have a clear foot and I don't have a quarter foot either. So I have to kind of guess where the one quarter mark is on the foot. So sometimes I put a little dash at the end so I can make sure I'm a quarter away. Uh, then a lot of times you'll see those triangles on the fabric. Let me show you. There should be triangles there. And what they do is they peek up. On the fabric I find that when I'm cutting with the rotary cutter I do have a hard time making those peaks so instead what I do is I just cut the fabric out and then I cut notches into the pattern and I put the fat the dots there with the marker instead of having that you know piece of triangle sticking up over here and I mean I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing I don't know but it's just something I do and it's worked so far my dresses are okay so that's how I'm doing that on there. So those are the markings I would put. There's a little mark for bow placement. And then here's another two markings. And I said, I just dab the holes and I put the markings there. And then um, in this place, I did cut that notch because I could fold it and cut the notch into that one for the placement. Okay. Now, Oh, and make sure you iron your pattern pieces. Sometimes I get away with not ironing pattern pieces. Sometimes it's a terrible thing. And in this case, these pieces are so small and they're going to go into like really exact places that I just went ahead and I ironed everything. Just works out. It works out better than a long one. Trust me on that one. Okay, so I'm preparing the yoke, right? So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stick, stitch my yoke sections together. As soon as I find them in the pile, let me spread these guys out so I can see them. Okay. And I've got my notches, my seam allowances, and I'm just going to stitch these together on the quarter inch. And it says with right sides together, but because my pieces are white, I really don't have right sides. Just lay them together nicely. Sometimes I pin them. You know what? Sometimes I go through the whole of the pattern and pin everything together. Because then I could just start stitching. Which is really cool. Somehow I seem to have gotten hot glue on this. That's sketchy. Okay, now after I do the seams for this, run these guys down the seams, what it's going to have me do is lay down the lace yoke um, along the pattern indicated. So Right here in the markings, it says trim placement. So I would lay the lace here along the trim placement. And then, let's see, then I would fold the neckband in half. This is my neckband. Okay. And there's a half mark here. So I'm going to fold that neckband in half. Stitch through. Okay. As I put that neckband all the way around these layers. 
So I'm going to go ahead and do that part and then I will be back. Okay, so here's where we are. Put the yoke together. And instead of using the gallon ribbon, because I was like, what is that? But it's the ribbon with the, uh, it's got the lace on the outside and it's got the ribbon on the inside of it. I have some, but it's pink and I didn't really see any. I wanted other ribbon I wanted when I was at Joanne, so that didn't work the way I wanted it to. It's a little pinchy in the corner. I might figure out something else to do with that. But at any rate, so instead I used this satin ribbon and laid it down in the place where it had indicated. Then I'm supposed to take the other satin ribbon and trim the neck, which I didn't like, and trim all around the yoke to hide the seam. This is where things get complicated. You put the front bodice, back bodice together, and then you want to put the yoke on. And I found these corners a little pinchy. And as you can see right here, I pinched in some fabric here. So what I'm going to do is release that pinched fabric and I'll probably go back and hand stitch this. That was a pretty tight corner to turn on my machine and I don't really like how that came out. It came out okay on this side but not really on this side. So I'm going to go back and fix that with a hand stitch so that's not quite so pinchy in that spot. See that, that's the way it should look. Sometimes this machine is kind of grabby, and so uh, sewing the little edges becomes a problem. But basically, this is how this is supposed to turn out. Okay, now, after you've gotten that far, the skirt itself is, um, the rest of it is pretty straightforward, okay? You take the sleeves and you want to finish the bottom edge of the sleeves. On this particular sleeve, let's see where it went off to. This particular sleeve does not have any sleeve caps or anything on it. Um, it's supposed to have elastic placement to kind of gather it, gather it across the top and then finish the edge and then kind of Put the elastic here and put the bow on here. I think I'm going to skip the elastic. Uh, and I haven't really decided what I'm going to do to fix that. Let me go ahead and stitch it up and see how it looks first. I might put a drawstring in it or put a tie on it. Let's see. So here's what I decided to do about the arm where I was going to put the elastic band. So I was just first just going to gather it and call it a day. That'll be fine. Then I decided that there's a technique that I saw in the, ooh, I want to say that's Pemberley Threads. I'm going to have to look it up now. But anyway, in the Anne uh, blouse, which I did ahead because I couldn't help myself. At any rate, that's the Edwardian um, blouse pattern. But they have the same kind of you know, sleeves. Well, actually, it's from the shirt that's kind of gathered and a little puffy to make that pigeon breasted shirt. And so, in order to make the puff stand out, um, it was gathered, and then you're supposed to take the gathers and sew across the band. Um, and that is supposed to hold the gathers up. So, instead of using the elastic, I'm going to do the same thing here. I've gathered these, and I'm just going to run the ribbon across to hold the gathers in. Now, I I was supposed to turn this back into the um, the black thread. I was supposed to reload my bobbin into the black thread. But honestly, I gotta tell you, I just kinda liked the white thread. And so I didn't change it. And I'm hoping I don't regret it. And pull that needle out. I'm, I'm just liking the way it looks. I can't tell you if there's any 
historical accuracy that or anything like that. I just like the way it looks. So that's just the way it's going to look. I'm trying to arrange these gathers down here so that they'll look right when they are stitched over. They won't be jumbled up. I'll have to, I'll see how it looks. If I don't like it, I'll redo it. Doing these historical uh, outfits, I think has, well, first of all, it, it has definitely increased my knowledge of historical gowns because I don't just sew from the pattern. I actually look up the advice that's been given about the, the style and all that kind of stuff. So I'm doing the research for it. And two, for the most part, the people who are writing these patterns are definitely doing their best to uh, delve into the, the patterns. You know, they're not just making up stuff. They're actually taking their time to flesh out the historical um, techniques that were being used for making these, constructing these garments. So I do feel like I'm kind of getting a sense of how to construct a whole historical garment, how to construct a garment for that particular time period and the manner that it was, you know, generally constructed. I mean, that's pretty good. I feel comfortable about it. I feel comfortable that if this was an adult size pattern, that it would be about the same techniques. I definitely feel like I'm learning something. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and take the gathers out for this one. Uh, and this is definitely different than putting together um, the, the techniques used for modern construction of garments and patterns. That's definitely for sure. Take the, the, going around these armholes uh, was a bit of a thing. I am definitely learning how to uh, be more precise with the machine. And I did a little bit of something when I did piecing for with the quilts, but not like this, not to this degree, because I tend to have quilts that have pieces that are, you know, squares, triangles, very straight, no rounded applique type pieces. So I'm, I'm really getting in my workout with sewing around the armholes and things like that. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. That looks pretty good. I lost a little bit of the gather at this end. I'll have to see if I can recapture some of that. But I think that turned out, turned out all right. Let's see how well I do on this arm. And I probably lost some of the gather because I didn't have it right here. So just cinch that in just a little bit more. That's probably where I lost it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get that fixed. So all that's left now to do is stitch down the sides. This is one of the first things I noticed is different in the historical construction from uh, some of the other patterns that I've encountered sewing, especially like simplicity patterns, where they have you stitch everything up and then you're like, stitching around the arm side and a lot of historical patterns instead have you putting on the sleeve and then stitching straight down through that seam right here. So I like to pin my seams, lay my seams. I'm supposed to press this seam towards the bodice, uh, but I didn't actually press it. Uh, sometimes I do press the seam, sometimes I don't. 
Sometimes the fabric is crisp enough that I can fold the seam and pin it into place. And it just kind of, it's like it folds down, creased down just by finger touch. Sometimes I really do have to press the seam. So right now I'm pinning everything into place. The gathers did turn out nicely over there. And I think there's like one little spot that I'm going to gather up a little closer to the tape. I'll do that later. Okay, and then it's just ready to be sewn through. But of course, I have to put more thread in the bobbin. So I'll get back to that in a moment. 